Hey everybody, it's been a while since I've done a book review, hasn't it? After my interview with David Bentley Hart and after my little hiatus of where I was going, when I did my video saying what books I was reading and all that, well, um, oh, the books that I was uh, mentioned in that video, I'm not doing a review on that. Actually, I'm doing a review on the new Joshua Cohen novel, The Netanyahu's. This was published a few weeks ago, and... After I read Moving Kings, I was really interested in his, in what his newest novel was going to be about because I really like his style. How it kind of reminds me of a mixture of the classic American Jewish novelists like Saul Bellow or Philip Roth. And he has his own unique spin to 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 what he writes because he's a he's a millennial and he writes about technology and the modern influences and stuff that people like Philip Roth and Saul Bellow wouldn't have written about because they wrote about their contemporary time, of course. But with this, what really interested me about this novel is that it's dedicated to Harold Bloom. And it says that in the um, beginning of the book, to the memory of Harold Bloom. And you all know that I'm a big Harold Bloom fan. He's one of my all-time, he is my favorite literary critic of all time. He passed away a year or two ago, and in the afterword, or what Joshua Collins calls the extra credits, he actually kind of in, gets into why he wrote this novel. And the novel, from what you can probably guess, it's about the Netanyahu's. It's about, or as the subtitle of the book suggests, an account of a minor and ultimately even negligible episode in the history of a very famous family. This is partly fiction and partly nonfiction because in his extra credit, which is essentially the afterword, Joshua Cohen mentions how in, jo in Harold Bloom's later years, he actually befriended him and they actually would, he would actually go to his house in New Haven, Connecticut. I think, no, not New Haven. What am I saying? In, um, in Connecticut and essentially they would get together and talk about literary figures, politics, all that kind of jazz, but, and he would get into his history. Harold Bloom, and Joshua Cohen acknowledges this in the book itself, in the afterword, that Harold Bloom has never written a memoir. Of all the books he's written, it's always about literature and poetry and criticism, but he's never written an actual memoir about his life. And he gives a few examples why that would probably be the case, especially when someone as gargantuan as Harold Bloom, it, it would kind of defeat the purpose, especially considering his anxiety of influence of what he came up with in the 70s of, as a literary understanding of literature. It would be kind of an oxymoron to do that, especially under his position. But he told Joshua Cohen a story about how one time when he was at Yale, he had to work with a committee or actually work with uh, someone who would be coming to teach at the university, hopefully. And, and the person was none other than Benjamin Netanyahu's father. Benjamin Net Net Netanyahu is the former prime minister of Israel. And his father's name was Ben Zion Netanyahu. And he changed it that way because in Jew when you look at Hebrew names, Jewish names, Ben is typically a way of saying of, some of someone. Like... If you were to say Yeshua ben Yosef, that would mean jo Yeshua, the son of Joseph. But with uh, with Netanyahu's name, Benjamin's father, ben Zion, Netanyahu means of Zion, which could mean of the, of the future of Israel in a way. And that's what it kind of gets into in the novel, but a little too much context and backstory. But it's kind of crucial with this novel if you want to get into it, because... Harold Bloom supposedly actually took, had a Netanyahu, Ben, ben Zion Netanyahu and his wife and kids stay with him and while he was doing this recommendation at the university and apparently it was just an awful mess. So Joshua Cohen found this really interesting and he's like, this would be a really good idea for a novel, a novelization to kind of add to what I like to, what he likes to tackle. And what, what the outcome is, is a main character whose name is, and I know this may sound very on the nose, Reuben Blum. Sounds like Carol Bloom, but Blum. And in the in the novel, um, the way it's structured, Reuben Blum is a historian. He's actually a, a historian, not of 
He's an, he, it's like a historian of like an econo of economics in a way, but he is he's being told to work on this committee to bring in Ben Zion Netanyahu, who wants to teach as a historian, but they only have a theo a theology position available at the Corbin College that they that they teach. It's a fictional university, by the way. So just to kind of give you an idea that it's not wholly historicized, but um. What he does is the historian, the main character, is obviously both and not a a it's it's a, it's a characterization of Harold Bloom as a character, and he and the way it's structured is he's writing from the perspective of like his later years. In the introduction, he, like the very first chapter, he's mentioning how he's writing. An introduction to the novel to say like what I'm about to tell you is what I experienced back in the 1960s and how I met Ben Zion Netanyahu and what all happened to me essentially but but he actually gets into this really interesting the first paragraph of the novel is really interesting he starts it by saying my name is Ruben Bloom and I'm an yes an historian soon enough though I guess I'll be historical by which I mean I'll die and become history myself. And this is a theme that is very prevalent, not only in this novel, but in a lot of Jewish American writers, and in, in general, because the thing about Jewish literature that distinguishes it from any other type of, of, of Americanized literature, although it might it has some connections with Southern literature as well, is that history and time, about how characters and ideas and identities essentially get lost or get transmogrified into time based on history and how we write down history. What, how can we distinguish the history from was from what, what isn't? It's that great question that uh, Judge Holden says in Blood Meridian: the history that differs is the history that was differs little from the history that was not. And this is a sort of a question that Joshua Cohen like many writers before him in the Jewish tradition and in Southern traditions and in all others. It's like, how do we distinguish history from what we just write? <clears throat> and he goes on a little further in the first paragraph. Goys believe in the word becoming flesh, but Jews believe in the flesh becoming word, a more natural, rational incarnation. And what, do you, what does he mean by that? I found this to be a really interesting inversion of logic here. When he means goys, he's obviously talking about Christians, Christianity and such, believe in the word becoming flesh. And that's, of course, the theology of John. When he says in the beginning was the word or in David Bentley Hart's translation, it's in the origin was the logos and that became the word and that became God or it was a God. But in this logic, he says that what differentiates Christian theology from Jewish theology is that the Jews believe that we are the flesh. We live as humans. We are born as humans. And even Robert Alter, in, in my interview with him, said how in Hebrew, the word nefesh means, like it can mean throat, but it also in a way kind of is a, is a synecdoche, meaning the entire human body, the human person. It's not like a spirit in a way that we think of like in a incorporeal sense that would be later thought up by Christian theologians. So when he says that Jews believe in the flesh becoming word, he's essentially saying we live and when, and when we die, we then become a word. We then become history, what is written about us and how we differentiate that from what actually was from what isn't. So Joshua Cohen through Rob, Rob, um, through Blum's character, Reuben Blum's character is kind of doing this, this sort of thing that, uh, like what, like what he's talking about right here is that how do we different? How do we know what history is? How do we know if it's true? And this is very crucial when it comes to the main to the character Ben Zion Netanyahu when he first shows up, and it only happens like maybe a little more than halfway through the novel because the first half of the novel is getting into Blum's interactions with his family, which I mean you you don't really have a Jewish literature novel without the family being having their little machinations going on. So when he when he actually enters the picture, we're told through and a few of the chapters are told through letters actually from people in Jerusalem 
professors who are either recommending you should look into, like actually put him on the faculty. And then there's another letter that says you probably shouldn't because he's more of a, he's a dogmatist. He's someone who's not interested in teaching history. He's interested in pushing a theological and political agenda over anything else. And this is where it gets complicated. Ben Zion Netanyahu, from what Joshua Cohen writes in his afterword, and also based on what the character says and, and is said about him in the novel, is that when he was a he was a historian, look it up. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's father, Ben Zion Netanyahu, was a historian. He wrote books on on the areas that were special to him, which was the Iberian times during the Crusades. It was during in Portugal the Inquisitions and such. And he had a theory, apparently, and I, I actually might look this up because in the back of the book, he mentions, uh, Cohen mentions that his magnum opus, Ben Zion Netanyahu's magnum opus, is a book called The Origins of the Inquisition in 15th Century Spain. And so he had a theory, apparently, that when the Inquisitions were happening, what we think of what actually happened was that Christians were using pogroms and and, and other various methods of torture and, and killing the Jews to convert them to Christianity. He actually has a different interpretation of that. Ben Zion actually thinks that that's, that's a bit of a lie or a misunderstanding. What he thinks the true point of the Inquisition was to actually not convert them, but to try to what to, to, but to actually try to do a, a reversal, to actually get back at the Christian monarchs and the Catholic Church. And the way they would do that was to set up a, a ploy, which is the whole pogroms, the inquisitions, the conversions are not really the thing. The real point of it was to actually put, which, which is to actually say that the Jews aren't a religion, it's a race. And he argues that the idea that Jews are not a nation or not a, I mean, they're not just a religion, that they're actually a race. It's in the blood within them. It He argues it's from the Inquisition times, that this was a way to kind of put blame on the Jews for, for that would be part of history, that this was the seed that would grow into what we now see as like the anti-Semitic traditions that are constantly going around it's very, it's a very complicated thing to get into, especially with how he structures it. But that's what Netanyahu believes, and that's what he says. He even says, at the point in the novel when uh, Blum, the main character, is takes him to the college to teach a, to teach a course, he mentions to the people, he's like, "Look, the thing about history and the thing about theology is." The, the, theologians need to work in exegesis, but me, I work in esegesis which is, I mentioned this with David Bentley Hart in my interview, which is exegesis is the study, the critical study of religious or any sort of text with a critical eye, and it's based on what you interpret of the text. But exegesis is actually kind of what modern American, like fundamentalist Baptists, evangelicals, and even a lot of certain traditions in the the Zionist movement, even like certain Jews, like in certain areas, or in any area, it's when you read a text and you find what you want to find in the text. You're not actually interpreting it. You're putting your own presuppositional beliefs into the text and saying, look, that's what it says. I believe I believe this is what it says. I'm going to read something. And if I see something that may be construed that way, then it's obviously that's what it is. That's what exegesis is. It's essentially a um, post hoc rationalization. It's circular logic in a way, begging the question. And... When he's finally, when Netanyahu is finally brought to the committee and they start questioning him, what is your, what do you intend to do here? And this is a, what I found really interesting right here. Speaking frankly, the specific period doesn't matter to me as much as do the Jews. This is Netanyahu speaking, who for me are chiefly a vehicle for the study of how history is written. One of them is like how, and he says, the study of who writes it, why, and how. I know the Jews are the chosen people, Dr. Netanyahu, but why choose them for this? What makes them the best vehicle, as you say, for such an undertaking? And this is Netanyahu again. Because of all the peoples of the world, none is less historical or less historically minded, which is curious given Judaism's antiquity, 
As Dr. Blum can surely confirm for you, it's a common enough quip among contemporary American Jews that Jewish parents would rather their children become pedi pediatricians or litig litigators than, say, the Messiah. But I would submit that even Messianism, even false Messianism, is more Jewish a discipline than history, whose allegiance to sublim subliminary powers such as regents and facts was traditionally regarded by the rabbis as idolatry. This is an interesting sort of position that Netanyahu is given. Apparently to him is, how do we determine what is history versus, like, what is really history? You determine that by how it's, how, how it's written and, and why it's written and who chooses it. This kind of gets into that whole, like, Winston Churchill cliche. It's like, history is written by the victors. It's determined... What we, what we think is really what really happened in the past is determined by a small group of people. And these people have certain knowledge, or maybe they don't, depending on where they are in this, in this hierarchy. If there is even one at that point, to be honest. But, um, and this is, the, this is one of the most crucial points of the novel. What is history? How is it written? And how do we reinterpret text and even traditions when it could, when there can be problems, and this is where Cohen, as an author and as a person and as a thinker, and I hate to, say, and I and I have to say this, but as a Jew, this is this is a big prop. This is a big thing he brings up in his works. It was a big one that was in Moving Kings. It was in that moment when um, Yuri or I can't remember which one said it to whom, but he was like, "I wish I could just forget about you and forget about this adherence to Judaism." But later in the novel. After all this commotion has gone on, and after Netanyahu has given his big speech, which he was giving to a to a big crowd, um, I wish I could probably find it wherever it is. Um, let's see, oh yeah, R um, Blum is talking to his wife. They're going back home after the whole talk. She's been in a really bad mood. She was a, uh, but to be honest, in, in the novel. When the when the Netanyahu's are at their house and they're actually you know um, getting to know each other, it's actually explained that uh, the Netanyahu's are very rowdy. Like when once they come in, they don't take off their shoes. They're being very rude and being self serving. They're doing whatever they want. But this is kind of Joshua Cohen's. Um, this is an interesting take on Judaism because in the Torah, I mean in the Torah. In the not in the stories, whenever a fellow he a, a fellow Israelite is coming to stay with you, the the typical custom is to let the men wash their feet, give them food, and be hospital, be ho have hospitality towards them. But he takes that trope, in the, which is in the Torah, and he kind of makes it a little bit more exaggerated. And it's a very funny novel. It's not all serious. And I, but anyway, I think I went off on a tangent. But anyway, it comes to this point where um. They're walking home. It's been really rough, and it's just all this craziness has gone on. There's talk about what a Jew is, what a Jew isn't, history of the Jews. How do we determine all that stuff? And then um, Blum says to his wife, uh, or actually um, the, the wife says to him first, when we were young, we took everything so seriously. Everything we read, every exhibition and concert and book, all those poems. We were serious people and believed in things. An idea is so sincere, and the way we talked, ethical aesthetics, and the moral passions of the culture, the way we talked about politics, the freedom from fear, the freedom from want, and how it was honorable to serve your country, and even, and how even being skeptical of your country could be a way of serving it. We were so earnest and principled by, but so intense about democracy and love and death, and if we knew what, what those things were. And Blum responds, I remember, we were good little Jews. And she says, what's wrong with you? Who said anything about Jews? I'm sick and tired of hearing about Jews. I'm talking about the two of us. Sorry. What I'm trying to say, Reuben, is that meeting this horrible man and his horrible wife, this is the Netanyahu's, by the way, it made me realize something. It made me realize I don't believe in anything anymore. And not just that, but I don't care. I have no beliefs, and I'm okay with it. I'm more than okay. I'm glad. I'm glad I'm getting older without convictions. 
This is almost the, in the exact same way of how Moving Kings was structured. It's not until like the very end of the novel where the two characters, two of the main characters, are discussing their Jewish nature or like what they think is Jewish nature. This is the point. It's about the whole history of what is history. They feel this, it's like what Netanyahu said that in his idea, Ben Zion Netanyahu, who is, who many people have considered like, and this is, and this is something Joshua Cohen mentions in the afterword. When Ben Zion Netanyahu died and passed away, people were saying how he was the seed that brought up Benjamin Netanyahu's idea of like a pro-Zion nation and all that kind of stuff. But, but what, but what Ben Zion, what Ben Zion Netanyahu really stood, what really stands in his message when I mentioned earlier in the video is how he argues in the Inquisitions, the idea of a, of Jews being nothing more than a, not just a religion, but now being an actual race a personhood, something that's within your blood of who you actually are. This is what this is going to. That moment where I just read about the wife being like, I'm tired of Jews. I'm talking about us. I don't have these convictions. Why can't I just be who I want to be? Why can't we just be happy? This is Cohen saying, this is addressing this question of being, what what is being a Jew? Is being a Jew someone who has to adhere to the Torah, adhere to your Jewish ancestry, adhere to your Jewish customs, what people say you are, what you're supposed to be, what Zionists say is you have to go and live out the promise that Yahweh actually said in the Torah, which is Israel needs to be a nation among nations. It needs to be the light that's, that, that distinguishes you from all things. And yet here they are saying, why can't we just be people? Why? This is the this is the brilliance of the Netanyahu's. It is funny, it's challenging, it's poignant, it's like novels like this are what hit me in the gut and, and and make me just proud to be a human being and being alive, and hearing voices that are going to challenge everything we know about nationality, identity, religion, politics. Like it's just. Joshua Cohen is a genius. I agree with Harold Bloom when he said that Joshua Cohen is actually up there with the younger generation of writers who can really tackle very complicated areas that have been struggling. We've been struggling for centuries. And he puts it in the mouth of Ben Zion Netanyahu, a person who, from what I can glean, Joshua Cohen has some at, some respect towards him, but also... In other areas, obviously not. But hey, we can always find something interesting from all different type walks of life. So yeah, this is an amazing novel. I would recommend anyone who's interested in religion, in theology, history, especially understanding history, how we determine what is historical or which is not. As a matter of fact, reading this kind of reminded me of a, a conversation in the movie The Sunset Limited based on the play by Cormac McCarthy. On the Blu-ray, there's a commentary with Samuel L. Jackson, McCarthy, and Tommy Lee Jones, and they're talking to each other. And it gets to the point in the film when Black asks the character White, he's like, this Gibbons decline and fall of the Roman Empire, is it a true book? And, and the White says, when it comes to events that actually happened, yeah, it's true. And Tommy Lee Jones in the commentary asks Cormac, he's like, like, how would you actually determine what a, what a true history book is? Like, how can we? And McCarthy just laughs. He just goes, <laughs> indeed. That's the question. How do we really determine what is truly history? This is a great novel, people. Read it. Read it with open eyes and open ears. Be welcoming for all things. And that's pretty much the video for today. And I hope you guys look into getting the Netanyahu's by Joshua Cohen. And that will be it. I don't know what my next video will be, actually. I might, you know what, actually, I'm not going to say what I might be doing next. That's just going to have to be a surprise for all of you guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Give it a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you haven't already, if you're into this sort of stuff. And I hope you guys have a pleasant day.